Hi there, and welcome to the Paula Fiscal Show. My show airs on Sundays on Channel 29 and Channel 20, 76 on Sundays at 3 o'clock p.m. We have a very special guest today by the name of Manaz Barihyan, who is an Iranian poet, and she also has gotten an award from Caminante Cultural, which is an organization run by Cristina and Francisco Herrera here in San Francisco. And she received this award for her participation in the community. And Manaz is going to tell us a little bit about her background, but first she's going to read us a poem. Man gulam qamaram qayr qamar hich magu. پیش من جو سخن شم و شکر هیچ مگو سخن رنج مگو جو سخن گنج مگو بر از این بی خبری رنج مبر هیچ مگو دوش دیوانه شدم عشق عشق مرا دید و بگفت آمدم نر مزن جام مدر هیچ مگو گفتم ای عشق من از چیز دیگر می ترسم گفت آن چیز دیگر نیست دیگر هیچ مگو This was uh, a poem uh, from Rumi Jalal Din Rumi and uh, I, the reason I read this poem at the beginning because I always honor my mother tongue I like to start with Persian uh, poem so. And it sounded very, very nice. I understand that uh, you just got back from Cuba, and since uh, we as Americans here are all very interested in learning exactly what's going on over there, can you tell us a bit about uh, the organization that you went with and uh, then uh, and how long you were there? Yes, I, um, I actually was uh, the first... American Iranian or Iranian American to go to Cuba, which was 2014. And again, I went back this year, 2016, and both them by invitation of International Poetry Festival, uh, which this, uh, you know, The Cuba. International Poetry Festival is held once a year? Uh, once a year in different countries. So and then this year was held in this one this was part of international poetry for Cuba so I got an invitation to go to Cuba like I've been to India I've been to different places oh, okay <clears throat> yes so the first time I uh, traveled to Cuba 2014 uh, I only visited uh, Havana so Havana being uh, capital a little bit was different then this time, 2016, which I was 10 hours in the car uh, going through different cities and going to Sierra Maestera. Uh, well, in uh, Havana, from what I understand, it's quite staged, and it's like going to a tourist area, and you don't have an opportunity to see the rural areas, right? Uh, not exactly. Actually, Havana also looks uh, very poor, there are lots of buildings that they need touch up, they need work. I, I felt the people in Havana was much happier. That's the difference I noticed because they have uh, restaurants, they have uh, museum, they have, you know, some public uh, facilities for people to go and enjoy themselves. So it was heavier in culture. Heavier in yes, culture, yeah. it's, a, it's a capital, more people, more tourists from Europe. It was saturated with tourists more from Europe. Yes. And people over their businesses could make a little bit more money. So, ah. you so could there see was more a car. higher, so the, there was a higher economic class. Higher, a little bit higher, but I can tell you that uh, a little bit higher in Havana, but my understanding, my uh, um, take from this second trip was that basically uh, Cuba 
divided poverty uh, everywhere. Everywhere, basically, there wasn't very good. Uh, I didn't think there was very good food anywhere, including um, Cuba, uh, Havana. Uh, it wasn't uh, lots of cars, like you couldn't get taxi easily. You couldn't, uh, you could get taxi easier in Havana, of course. But we went from Havana, 10 hours drive, to pass through um, Santa Clara, Pilon, and many small cities till reach to Sierra Maestera. It was a place that Fidel and 80 of his friends planned Cuba revolution. So it, it was also very difficult to go, but it was really, 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 Majestic to be there, and um, it was just the basic line is that Cuba doesn't have money; it's poverty everywhere. That's so the division, say. the dividing lines of the of the poverty that you saw, is then something that was quite shocking, and it is shocking to most Americans uh, when uh, they go I, and visit. I think uh, I see more homeless people in actually San Francisco. But you also see lots of, you know, lots of elegance, lots of wealth, lots of beautiful cars. But you don't see that over there in Cuba, anywhere in Cuba, a little so you bit don't, more. You're telling me that they don't have any homeless, they don't have any mentally ill that are outside of an institution. All their mentally ill because, people are in institutions. Because their medicine is uh, free. Yes. Education is free. Yes. So people have... They don't have to spend money, even if they don't have money to take their sick, their mental patients. They take them to a hospital. And actually, the first time I went to Cuba, it happened that I got sick. In 2014, yes, you got sick. Yes, I got sick. I was actually lucky to get sick because I went and I saw their hospital firsthand. And they gave me excellent service. It didn't take a long time. We didn't have to go through lots of red tags of filling forms, everything. Within 10, 15 minutes, even as a tourist? As a tourist, as a tourist. And I didn't pay a penny because when I entered Cuba, uh, they asked for $40 for my uh, expenses when I get sick in Cuba. Even if I need a surgery, that $40 will cover everything. So I went to hospital within 10, 15 minutes. Uh, right, the nurse came right away within 10, 15 minutes. The doctor came, I had IV in my hand. They took, took care of me within three, four hours. I felt better and I left. So I really appreciated that. So, yes, yes. So there's that, that's definitely a um, difference between our system yes. and their system yes. when it comes to health care. The, the, the thing is that I'm so happy that Cuba is opening its door to the world, to America, to the United States, because they will have more uh, economic relationship. They can import, export, and they can build their country. They can spend money on their buildings, and you know, uh, I was really, really, really happy that uh, the relationship between U.S. and Cuba started. Cuban people are very nice people. Um, I didn't think uh, they were happier people in Cuba. They were happier in Havana. Happier in, the, in Havana, Havana, but you say but because not that much in other small cities. People seem to me a little bit. Well, maybe they were a little reserved too to have Americans traipsing through on a, from uh, buses to look at look at them, right? They weren't depressed, but they weren't really happy, happy, happy. There weren't any there weren't any festivals to receive the Americans then. They they receive uh, poets from all over the world. They are oh, not okay. unfamiliar with that. They weren't, but they were very. Uh, hospitable. They were nice people. They they were very very nice to us. Very nice. I really uh, like uh, Cuban people. Uh, the nature is absolutely beautiful. But again, the roads needs work. Uh, transportation. So the infrastructure has yes, not been yes. maintained. Yes. But good poets, good writers. I can talk about that. They had lots of lots of good poets. And hopefully their voices will come out of Cuba even more after they open the door. Oh, yes. 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 Because we, we they were really, really, really So good we poets. can expect that they will send yeah. over to us yes. poets. And, and I, your organization will probably be bringing in people? 
Yes, because I'm part of uh, Revolutionary Poets Brigade in San Francisco, RPB, which is started by Jack Hirschman uh, five, six years ago, and now is growing. RPB has branches in many branches in Italy, France, Chicago, New York, many other countries. And we are very proud that the first place that RPB started is here in San Francisco. And this was originally started by Jack Hirschman? Jack Hirschman and a few other people, but right now, basically, Jack Hirschman is the one in charge and running it. That's he, great. He, he was, he, uh, everybody in San Francisco, I'm sure they know Jack Hirschman. He was uh, previous, uh, I mean, a few years ago, he was a poet laureate in San Francisco. He's a great and poet. For, and for those of you that are just joining us, this is the Paula Fiscal Show. My guest today is, I have to look, Mas Nas Badihan. And she is an Iranian poet, and um, she also is a translator, and she recently received an award from a local organization here, Caminante Cultural, that is managed by Cristina and Francisco Herrera. So you can watch the show at 3 o'clock p.m. on Channel 29, and it's also run on Channel 76, and I upload all the shows to YouTube. And you can reach us at paulafiscalshow at gmail.com and also a Twitter handle and a Facebook page. So once again, thank you so much for joining us. And we're going to ask our lovely honoree a couple of more questions. And uh, we'll go ahead and complete our interview. So my next question for you is, now I understand you're an internationally well-known poet right now, and you also do translations, but you also had a former life where you were a dentist. Can we talk about that just a few minutes? Oh, uh, yes, we can, yes. Uh, I'm also a painter, which painting and poetry I be, I've been doing since a very young age, 12, 13. But uh, uh, I also, when I was in uh, Iowa, going to writer's workshop at the same time. Uh, I entered uh, university and became a dentist in the University of Iowa. And after that, I worked part-time for a few years. Um, I taught in dental school in San Francisco, in the Goonie Dental School. Uh, but uh, I uh, put everything aside because the job of being poet, translator, and uh, artist was something closer to my heart, and I could not mix the two exactly well together. And uh, you have been a poet since you were 12 years old, yes, you said? Yes, yes, yes. So yes. That, that was your first dream. Exactly, exactly. That's and true. When, when you went to the School of Dentistry, that's not just two or three years. Isn't that a four or five year well, After process? After you get bachelor degree, you need to go another uh, um, four years. Another four yeah. years. Yeah, That's and right. then you so have to take board exams. That's eight, yeah. nine years of, of prep Yes, work. but uh, because uh, when I came to this country after the Iran Revolution 1979, we just came because my husband had a scholarship in Johns Hopkins University. So we were supposed to stay here for eight months and go back. Then the t situation got bad, hostage situation, all these things, you know. So we decided to be here, and I decided to study. Uh, I also have actually a master's degree in sociology that I got in 80 when I came here. And then the last degree, I'm just, I have a bag of degrees. The last degree I got was uh, in 2000, uh, 2007. MFA, Master of Fine Art in Poetry. So the one that you're most proud Actually, of. Actually, and, exactly. and And that you... Closer to the, my heart. Closer to your heart. Yes. Is the one exactly. you received in Master of Fine Arts. Yes, in poetry. In poetry. Correct. And then you talked about, a little bit about uh, your being also an artist. You're a painter. What yes. kind of painting do you do? I... Um, started, of course, years ago, like... 40 years ago, just by painting, let's say, nature. And uh, my l recent paintings is a collection of 50 paintings called Recycled Woman, which I have collection of poems with the same name. So I painted 
recycled woman. Recycled woman is a woman that is not a woman just from, let's say, one location in the world, is not from Iran, is not from America, is not from Africa, is a woman that is made of all the women in this world. So has the problem, pain, and happiness and honor of all the women in this world. So I painted that. Uh, I will have an uh, exhibition in a I year. I was just going to ask exhibition you, when is the year. studio, but there, when, when will there be an exhibition? Yes, will there be a big show? There will be, and there will be a book will be published uh, uh, this year, at the end of the year, called Recycled Woman Poems. It's about 25 poems, selection of my poems, with about 25 of my painting. And uh, it's going to be bilingual. And you're doing this as a uh, collaboration with anyone? Or are you doing this there on your own? There is an organization, Vagabond, their literary uh, organization. They're publishing it for me. That's wonderful. We we'll yes. look forward to yes. seeing that mm -hmm. and uh, perhaps covering your studio opening. Yes. Uh, if you don't mind, I am going to read one of these poems. Oh, yes. Uh, Let's go ahead and, and listen to another one of your poems. Will this be in English or in Farsi? In English. Uh, okay, this is uh, an English my one. My poem, if I can find where I put exactly what I wanted to read, but that's it. I'm going to read the one. It is uh, called Pomegranate Tree, and this is really one of my favorite poems. Nothing will happen if this pomegranate tree that I water every day forgets me. Nothing will happen if no one remembering me. There will be woman in this world and in this city. He will carry all my pains on their shoulder. Who will walk with my legs. They will fall in love with my heart and enjoy the stars with my eyes. Woman who will write my poems about love and wars. There are women who will go to bed with their lover with my body. They will kiss with my lips. They will talk with my voice and they will water pomegranate trees with my hands everywhere in this world. I am all the women. That was wonderful. Thank you. And now will you be repeating that in Farsi? Uh, you think in that Farsi, I... Or is there really, another one that you want uh, to... Let me, I, I don't think I brought that in Farsi. Okay. Um, uh, but I'm glad it was in English, actually, mm -hmm. so <laughs> our reader could understand. Let me read another poem in, of my poems in Farsi. Thank you. Which is, I'm recycling, but I'm not going to translate. We are just going to read it. در خواب ها یه تو می شکفم بر می گردم به چشم ها یه تو به سو سوی راز ناکان به نم نم آنها به وقت آشقی به اتاق کوچکی که در آن اندوه من را خواه کردیم دوباره می شوم زن دوباره هرگز از ریش نمی مانم در باغ های سوخته جهان هرگز سکوت خاموشم نمی کند جرقه میزنم از اعماق خاکستر شعله میکشم از انتهای خاموشی دوباره میشوم ایستا و تندیس هزار سالم جان میگیرد کنار هر پنجره خاموش این جهان That was wonderful. Oh, thank you Paula Th and thank you for having me in your show. So uh, of course. Yeah. And uh, in your Travels, if you don't mind, are going back a little bit to the traveling poet in you. Are there other countries that you've also visited? I uh, was in first uh, Kerala in India. The, the, in their first international poetry event, they invited me. I was there. Um, and, of course, lots of invitation in the United States, different places. I've been, like, Ohio... Iowa, different states. Uh, besides that, oh, I've been in Italy. I had a poetry event in Italy also a few years ago. And Italy, of course, is renowned for its culture and its poetry. Uh, yes, and, yes. And I its, uh, in and Italy, not to mention food. 
<laughs> oh, yes, yes, of course, of course. Um, uh, I just want to just comment again about Cuba because I just came back from Cuba. Cuba is still uh, with me every moment I can. Uh, that uh, um, Cuban people are very proud people, and all the poets uh, talk about how proud they are about their country. But I think also they are happy that they are gonna, the doors are going to open for them towards the entire world. Uh, another problem I had in Cuba, there is not internet access everywhere. There was just designated areas. Oh, that's right. We were talking about yeah, that. Yeah, I had to buy a briefing. card and be in a special location. And even that, it wasn't good connection. So uh, you is can. Is that uh, going to change, do you think, now? Uh, with the oh, I'm thinking opening? Some I mean, did Verizon already move in? Did AT&T move in? Are they going to let in Comcast? Uh, people had cell phone. I saw everyone had cell so phone. So the cell phones. Yeah, but internet access, not. I, I, we saw that there was a big company uh, with better cars that um, we called for a car to drive us back to Havana from right. Pilon. And there was a company which I thought some people started just newly. And I saw some construction going on with, in Havana, which I didn't see in 2014. So does that mean they're going to have the Ubers and the Lyfts? Oh, and the probably not. Yellow just cab? More taxis, more cars. Better, because the cars are very old from 50s, 60s. So they're going to have, hopefully, hopefully, people, Cuban people deserve this. They respect uh, Fidel. Everywhere, uh, basically, was uh, Che Guevara's statue and picture. Not much about Fidel, but Che Guevara. I think Fidel decided not to have his picture, but yeah, <laughs> yeah, they should be proud of themselves. So their poetry was a little bit different than poetry that poets write in this country, because poetry always comes from suffering and things that affects you. So like in Iran, poets write about... Uh, the, yes, the yeah, pain. You know, and, yeah, and the, the pain, whatever, you know, yes. And so um, poetry in Cuba also, a lot was about nature, because they have beautiful nature, and also about humanity. And here in uh, San Francisco, we all listen very attentively and carefully to the stories that we hear about your visits to Cuba because uh, you have to admit it that we've been fed a, 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 a lot of information that perhaps is not accurate, perhaps is, leaves out some small details of the people. Uh, what, what I told you exactly what I saw, really, really. People were... Uh, happy, not extremely joyous. Uh, their emotion was a little bit, you know, kind of slow. Do you, do you think that that was more or less uh, a reflection of the uh, discontent or the uh, way that Americans are portrayed? Um, I'm not sure how to... Uh, you mean Americans portray them like that? No, no, that we are portrayed to them, to the Cubans, that we're very capitalistic, that we're very materialistic, oh, that we're... Oh, of course, this so country that has a lot compared to, to that. Yes. This country wastes so much food, clothes, so much, so much, so much. Over there, what they have, they consume. Like, they, in the table, they don't have 10,000... We went to a few restaurants, and even in, uh, yeah, in uh, Santa Clara, and the restaurant just had hamburger. With nothing extra in the plate, just we, bread and meat. We have well, we That's have it. we have restaurants like that too that just serve hamburgers. No, uh, but here they serve hamburger with chips, with that's some right, of these, that's right, a with that, with we have a lot ketchup. Of, we, with we, this. Yeah, we do we do go overboard on the condiments. Oh, what kind of food you uh, the bread you want? What kind <laughs> of meat you want? More what? choices. Choices. We have much, many more choices. There are. That's there all. Are, that's all. We, we just have more but choices. I have to admit that there are also lots of extremely poor homeless people in this country. Well, in, I mean, in, in our country, in a, yes. That, this is a capitalist country, and you're expected to see well, there's lots going, of lots of rich people. Yeah. Oh, unbelievable. And lots of uh, poor people. Hopefully, uh, this country is also fixing itself. Hopefully. Well, we try to fix ourselves as we go along. Yeah, <laughs> we yeah. mm -hmm. we here in San Francisco uh, are doing more of an emphasis on on the homeless or the yes. mentally ill. Yes. Our our yes. police department's going through some some uh, new uh, leadership 
programs yeah. and, and our housing also is uh, being reviewed and we're you going know, to be Paula, doing a lot of that. Really, my take of all these things in the board is that board doesn't need war going on because it's expensive. We need to spend that money on people everywhere in the world. Refugees, people, poor, needy people. Needy people, yes, I understand. Um, we are going to wrap up this uh, interview and this conversation, and I'm going to give you a minute or so to give a final word to perhaps anyone out in the audience that might feel like they would like to um, become a poet like yourself. Um. <laughs> As I said, I grew up in Iran. Uh, I moved to the United States at the peak of revolution, Iran Revolution, 1979. And uh, I've been poet. If you're a poet, no one can take it from you. I raised kids. I went to dental school. But I, nobody could take poetry from me. All those years, I wrote poetry. doesn't matter what I was doing. I wrote poetry. I woke up early, and I wrote poetry to uh, empty my heart to just uh, whatever makes me happy, whatever upsets me. And I'm very happy uh, to be in this country, especially in San Francisco. It's a very lovely place. I moved to San Francisco in 2004. So before that, I was in Iowa. For those who want to read my poetry and know more about me, I have a website, www.mahmag.com, M-A-H-M-A-G.com or .org. And my name is Mahnaz Badihian, B-A-D-I-H-I-A-N. And thank you very much for listening to me and Paula. And thank you, Paula. Thank you so thank much you. for joining us. At this time, I would like to thank our sponsors, the Current Pacific Institute for Criminal Justice, Gypsy Rosalie's Wigs and Vintage, the White Rose Boutique, which is by, owned by Ursula Marston in the West Portal, the San Francisco Investment Development, General Contractor Pat Lakey, and Chef Sharon Lees, the Verlene Iris Culinary Academy. So thank you once again for joining us, and stay informed.